not have a reformation. I mean, that was, that to me is one of the, the great challenges, is that there, you, you, there actually is some liberal streams of Islam, but they're, they're under the radar for safety reasons, right? And, and so in Judaism, you've got reform Judaism, the, the word was very purposeful and there was a recognition of reformation, you know, and, and so it happened in Christianity and in Judaism, but I don't think it's happened, it, it certainly hasn't happened in a big way. And so, and, and I, I don't know that I have a role in that. Uh, however, well, I do have a role in that, which is to be supportive of the folks who are trying to make that happen. And I know some of them through now being part of this secular movement. And we've got to do our job in the secular movement to actually give them a bigger platform. So one of the things I, I heard from um, some of the leaders in the secular movement, so is that for me? <laughs> so someone, you know, we can talk about, we can have the same kind of conversation around ethnicity and race also, and, uh, and that there's, there's ethnic pride and there's racial pride and there's uh, LGBTQ pride, all of which can be brought into the secular movement and should be and has to be. And I went to my first secular leader summit in January and there was a recognition that it was not a diverse enough group. So I think that's the role that we can all play is let's diversify ourselves and whatever that might mean. You know, right now it might mean scholarships. I'm, I'm Facebook friends with a woman who fled Bangladesh and just spoke at American Atheist Conference, oh, which I didn't I go heard, to. I was there, I heard her. Yeah. It's, it's pretty, what a story. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. it is life-threatening to be openly atheist in Bangladesh, and she's applying now for uh, citizenship under, what's the? Um, asylum. 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 Asylum, thank you. She was flown down there to present. You know, American Atheist made sure to get her there, and you know, I'm in a position where my organization flew me to the Secular Leaders Summit, but we, the organizations that can do that need to see who else is out there that needs help to get there and needs a platform and needs to be raised up. So, so that would be, that's the only thing I feel I can do, but I'd love to hear if there are other ideas also. This is just a plug. Um, we belong to the Jefferson uh, Humanist, and their uh, next book group discussion on September 9th is going to be on the uh, book, the, the novel, uh, The Plot Against America by Philip Roth. Right. <laughs> and that uh, was really, a, a, I haven't read him since Portnoy's complaint, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, uh, a very powerful account of these issues of religious Judaism, ethnic Judaism, yeah. cultural, secular, political, it just really is a powerful presentation. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm of a generation of, of uh, American Jews whose life was dramatically changed when I read Portnoy's complaint <laughs> as a teenager. Uh, it's, and it's a, just a great example of cultural Judaism because people can connect in very deep ways. I mean, that was a life-transforming read, and I didn't, you know, if I had never walked through a synagogue I, doors, I don't think that it would have been any less powerful, because that's not what it was about. Uh, it was about minority status uh, from a particularly Jewish perspective, and it was about um, being nuts, which most Jews are, and you know that's why we had to invent psychotherapy. Uh, but I'm proud of that, you know, in a weird, in a weird way. And, and I, I think that, you know, but one of the things that I've learned, particularly in 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 being intermarried and interracially married and internationally married, is that everybody has amazing stories in in their ethnic backgrounds that I think all of it should be should be mined for meaning and so I'm thrilled to have Japanese family members and to be able to go to Japan usually around once a year and it's an amazing country to visit those of you who've been there and it's an incredibly rich culture and 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 they're really into ritual too but not in a theistic way um, and 
I know more about Japanese history than my wife does, but she pronounces all the names much better than I do. But um, that's my connection, is the history. And, and I'm thrilled that my kids will have a connection to that rich history. But when you talk about that, that sense of wanting con continuity or, or um, the, the, the continuation of Jewish identity. So let's say my kids, who are being raised here in the US, at a certain point when they're in college or adulthood, go to Japan, love it, meet somebody there, move there, have kids there, and the lineage goes on through Japanese and the Jewish piece was just a blip, I would feel some measure of loss. But it's so much further down my list of wants for my kids which start with health and then happiness and fulfillment and, and finding meaning in their lives and being good people and productive. And then, you know, maybe by 10, yeah, and then they find some meaning in, in Judaism. So it's, if it's never gonna hit that top five, then it's, it's got to, you know, then, then it's harder to say that this is my overriding goal. I, I have much more, uh, much different hopes for them. So that, that, but that is a piece that I feel also. I happen to have the advantage of having their Nana and Papa like 25 minutes away and my in-laws, my in-laws live on the other side of the planet and don't speak my language. How great is that? <laughs> well, when you were talking about rituals, um, I, I grew up, my parents were atheists. So, but we, my, my family and the extended family, we still celebrated, celebrated uh, Christmas. If, if it was a cultural, it was a cultural thing in that it was right. a Christian cultural thing, a white Christian cultural thing. So, but Christmas was all about Santa Claus and presents and the tree and all that stuff. That's all we knew. And same thing with Easter. We celebrated Easter. What? Nobody Easter went to church, but we had the chocolate eggs and the, you know, the, that whole thing. And it was, it was, I don't know, it was just part of our community's rituals, right. and we just adopted those or just carried those on because I mean, maybe some generations back it was Christian. Um, but when I think more broadly about what ritual does for us, and you were talking about, you used the word survive at some point, and I think you know if you look at ritual from more like oh, I'm kind of get sciency here, but from an anthropological standpoint, all societies have rituals. I mean. Individuals have rituals and, and societies and small groups have rituals. And they're adaptive in some way. I think ritual gives us some predictability and control over our lives in a way that provides security. And what does all that lead to? You increase the probability that you're going to survive. So it's sort of an evolutionary force in a, in a greater sense, I think. Uh, we, we call it ritual, it's just adaptive. Well, I mean, if you're Mayan human sacrifice, maybe that wasn't very adaptive. <laughs> but you know, but there are, no, there are rituals that, that are, are adaptive and maladaptive because they, they might be uh, based on a superstition. But that's part of a ritual as well. It's not a very adaptive one. But um, uh, so, so I think we can't get away from it. I don't care what you get, yeah, what Tom Flynn says. I've argued, I know him, and I had a little argument with him about this. And I like your response to him. I didn't think about it at the time, because he would say, nope, every Christmas, I'm in the office. I go in, and I do my eight hours, and, and I wish I would have thought, well, that's true. <laughs> <true. laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah. So it's, it's some, there's something that we find comfort in. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, an important, important part of my journey um, happened when I was 12 and preparing for my bar mitzvah. I, I mentioned I grew up in the conservative movement, so the bar mitzvah was reading a Torah portion in Hebrew, chanting it in trope, which they, there was no way that I actually went to Hebrew school three times a week, but nobody was learning the skill of, of chanting trope. So you get what was then a cassette, and you put it into your cassette recorder, remember where you push play, but if you hit the red button and play, then it records, so you just push play, but he took the tab off the cassette so you couldn't record it anyway. My, there's no way my, I can explain that to my kids. Um, so I, I memorized 
someone else chanted it into this tape recorder and I had to memorize this <laughs> bad song in a language I don't understand. And I was miserable and I knew at that time this is a huge waste of my time, this is not a skill that I ever am going to use again and I was correct because I've never used it again. <laughs> very unha and language was not my skill either as my wife will tell you. And so I um, remember vividly because I remember where we were standing in my house yelling at my mom that thinking that this is going to be such a bombshell. I said, I'm not having a bar mitzvah because I don't even believe in God. And she says, well, I don't either, and you're having a bar mitzvah. <laughs> and, and I had to think to myself, you know, I knew it wasn't just about saving face because I'm actually second generation Jewish communal professional. She spent her whole career in the, the JCC, the Jewish Community Center movement. She was executive director of a Jewish community center out on Long Island for the last 20 years of her career. And so I knew that here was someone who's dedicated her life in service of the Jewish people and for her to say, I don't believe in God either. And of course that was the one and only time we've ever really discussed it. But um, it, was, it, was, it was profound for me and I wish I had known at that time because already by that point, Rabbi Sherwin Wine had founded this movement in suburban Detroit, and this was a, an alternative that I was unaware of and that I couldn't discuss. Mm. But in retrospect now, I realize that not only were my parents atheists, but I'm third generation because my grandmother, who, who survived the Holocaust, was atheist, and, but, and I don't know whether she was atheist even before the Holocaust or if God died in the Holocaust as it did for so many Jews who survived and for so many people who have taken the time to research and understand what happened in the Holocaust. It's, to me, very difficult to see how someone comes out of that understanding still thinking that there's a God who intervenes in, in human affairs. So I'm third generation atheist, but still uh, all of that. So my grandmother came at it from, sadly, I think, the same Ethnicism, ethnic, ethnicity, ethnos, ethnocentricity, and racism that Hitler did, because that was the mindset of the world. It wasn't, it like she. It's not that the Jews weren't also thinking we're a completely separate people because they were, and so her. Talk. Her speech to me was that if I marry somebody who wasn't Jewish, then I'm finishing Hitler's job. And it's pretty powerful to hear it from someone who survived the Holocaust. But I have to say that my half-breed Jewish Japanese kids are, I think, a way worse nightmare for Hitler than if I had stuck to my own kind, right? He would have preferred stick to your own kind. And frankly, uh, so, and that's not why I married her, but I think that, um, she, my grandmother was wrong about that, and that the, the the. But I understand where she was coming from because the world had that mindset, and and I think that the Holocaust it hopefully exploded it for a lot of people, but unfortunately, not for enough people. And our work is really cut out for us, as as we can all see by what's happening in in our own country. Jim. Well, um, we talk about diversity and we talk about the culture, and I'm wondering, are those two at odds with each other? You mentioned the Jewish Community Association, is it called? JCC, Jewish Community Center. Which there are... Lots of. Many. <laughs> and I, I believe you're still you're speaking at these places? Tomorrow. <laughs> Come on out. Boulder JC, it's a beautiful big building. So that it seems that that also is welcoming to all the different the different threads of Judaism. Right. It's welcoming to, identity to everybody. Right? To everybody. Um, but do we have that understanding? I mean, right. I am not of Jewish identity, even though I've given each of my children a Hebraic name. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I didn't understand that I would be welcome at such a place. Oh, yes, yeah. right. definitely. And did those of Beth Amin know that they could be welcomed here at the secular hub that is mm -hmm. primarily in an Anglo-Saxon majority Protestant Catholic kind of community. 
diversity. Yeah. So uh, it's well. It's so we were talking about two different things. There. Yeah. There's yeah. There's a lot of Jewish people. Yeah. 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 About ten percent. <laughs> yes. No. I think in my look. I, I wish I could have just taped, and I don't know if that's on, but I'd love to share your comment with the wider Jewish community because so first of all, there's a couple of different things going on, but the word you used was barrier, which is a word I've been using for decades in terms of helping the Jewish community identify what the barriers are to to people. And so this conversation today talked about some of those barriers like meaning and value and why would I do it, you know, ex, ex, helping people understand that. Um, but also a big barrier is belief. And a lot of Jews think that if I don't believe, then there's no point in me being part of the Jewish community. So that's a part, a piece that I'm working on today as well. But the difference in what you're describing is, my understanding of this place is it's, it's, it's labeled secular and therefore, if you're secular, you're welcome here. And who actually comes is a, a diversity challenge that needs to be addressed in other ways, but it's not labeled for that. Whereas the Jewish Community Center uh, might has as a barrier the word Jewish in it, which I have, and I've consulted with dozens of JCC boards and, and have brought up that very point. However, as m some of you may know, the, the, the one of the largest core businesses of Jewish community centers is a health center, right. and, and the overwhelming majority of their members are not Jewish. So, and I'll, I'll give you an example from the Christian world, which is what does YMCA stand mm -hmm. for? Or, you know, Young what is right. the C is for Christian in YMCA. They have changed their name legally to just YMCA. There's no Christian programming in the YMCA's anymore. That's not the case for the Jewish community uh, and for the JCC movement, and I think that they would feel a tremendous loss. However, it's it's a fric it's a point of friction. There's a the JCC on Staten Island is built. It has a 99 year lease from the city of New York, and in taking that, they had to agree to certain church state separation pieces. So there are certain Jewish ritual things that might happen in other JCCs that won't happen at the Staten Island JCC, or they have to outsource it. So they'll do it in their space, but it's outsourced, like, you know, they, they play around with it. But um, J the JCC movement, a piece of what they're in business to do is this notion of Jewish identity, Jewish continuity, and Jewish meaning. But if you walked in there, I don't know that you would necessarily feel odd or out of place because it looks a whole lot like a YMCA. But, uh, you know, words matter, labels matter, uh, and and so Secular Hub, I think, is as neutral as you can get, and if we're lacking in diversity, then we have to uh, talk about it. And I'll tell you, from my experience working in the Jewish community, you need to actually explicitly, and this is also why I asked, what does this do for you? We need explicit explanations and statements now. The time for subtlety is long gone in all aspects of our lives. We need to actually say, so if it's not on the materials that you guys put out, you might want to consider saying, who is this for? And include people of all racial and ethnic backgrounds and LGBT and put the rainbow flag on it and make sure that you're engaging people. And, and so that's true for the Jewish community as well. If we're not, and the reason why we need to explicitly state it, and I've spoken to many people who've experienced this, people have been told, you will be welcome and then they get there and they're not. And then it's a lot harder to convince them that we are a warm and welcoming community when they have they know that it may not be the case. And so if you hope to engage LGBTQ people, then you've got to put that rainbow flag on your material and say we are um, LGBTQ inclusive and, and, um, and, and stand for equality. So just speaking about the Boulder JCC, I happen to be on the programming committee there. And just to back up what Paul has just said, they're going to be, there's going to be a music program every month from September to June, I guess. And it's not just Jewish music. It's, uh, it's the world music. We're really pushing in that direction. So look into it. OK. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, let's take two more questions, and then go ahead. Thanks. I'm not quite sure what the question is, my question is. But I know when you were talking about 
minority status and um, Jews having mi minority identity and being able to identify with other minorities. For instance, there were a number of Jews on the founding board of the NAACP. I don't know if anyone in the Jewish community other, other than history majors <laughs> in college knows that um, because there's friction now between the two communities and historically we've been allies but okay so there was that and then also there's Jared Kushner um, in the White House and all these as Jews have become more um, wealthy or successful, I'm, I'm cognitive dysfunction. Anyways, um, so they, I know, I you know what? I grew up, and I swear to God, until <laughs> You're not allowed to do that I know, I know, I know, I <laughs> know. Um, until like five, ten years ago, I. Did not, I know this is going to be so naive, it's going to sound that way, but I didn't think that there was any Jew that wasn't a Democrat. Um, <laughs> because of our history, and it was, in, I was shocked when someone, when a friend, a Jewish friend of mine um, told me, you know, he said, oh yeah, you're a Democrat. And I was, uh, and I was just sat there thinking, yeah. "Oh my gosh!" And you're Jewish, and you, how can you not be? <laughs> um, so, like, have you heard of Henry Kissinger? <laughs> 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 no, I, I hear, I hear what you're saying, and know. and, you know, I, I think it's it, it's a bit, um, it, it's a con, it's a difficult conversation that I hope I would love for the Jewish community to be having more of and I, I think it's only tangential to uh, secularity but basically there's the difficulty as I said of putting Jews into any box and so Ashkenazic Jews Jews of Ashkenazi background like myself in America are white and I will argue with you if you feel differently <coughs> separately, but I have, I've been stopped more times than I should probably admit by police officers. I've never gone to jail. I've never been thrown onto the hood of a car. None of that. So we are white and we benefit from white privilege. However, we have a minority status because anti-Semitism is real, mm -hmm. but anti-Semitism is not racism. So that's why it's so confusing and that's why so many Jews don't want to say I'm white, but if you don't say you're white, then you can't begin the process of understanding that you have white privilege, which is a process, and I appreciate what you're admitting, and I'll admit that I, as a 20 and, and maybe even into my 30s, may have argued that I'm not white because I'm Jewish, because my no, grand, no, because, I'm no, no, but let me, let me, my grandparents were, suffered horrible persecution, but that was two generations ago. I've had nothing but benefit. So, we are tenuously, dangerously close to a time when we were, first of all, in America, not considered white. There's a book called When Jews Became White Folks, so that's, uh, you know, historically. But where we are right now is in a place of, of privilege and, and in a place of minority status. So that gives us a unique position to help people who are in full minority status, wow. which I wish Jared Kushner would do, but he's not clearly not going to. And the fact that we were involved in the NAACP, that Rabbi Joshua Heschel marched arm in arm with ML Martin Luther King, which you will see every MLK day in, in the Jewish newspapers as if it just happened yesterday, but that happened 60 years ago. What are we doing today? I mean, that's the questions that, that we should be asking. Um, and, and I think that we, we can open up that conversation and, and we can relate it to uh, and help people understand it in part through this a secular movement that recognizes minority status. Terry had a question. Yeah, you, you were talking about barriers, um, uh, institutional type barriers. And I'm wondering how many people have gone to a mosque mm -hmm. have stepped into a mosque. 
uh, my first experience was when Rabbi Lerner from uh, California came to Denver and organized a Jewish uh, Islam interfaith yeah. type of meeting in a mosque and and that's when I first felt comfortable you know entering a mosque I mean I, I don't think I would have done it on my own <laughs> and um, because of those barriers I mean you, you you've got these mental barriers that you're not going to be welcome there yeah. and um, and and it was it was quite an experience yeah. and since then um, I've, I've gone to a mosque in Boulder where there was a uh, an empathetic um, type of community um, uh, outreach to say that uh, that you know you sh you shouldn't be discriminated against and and I and I and there I, I was exposed to a lot of progressive thinking but I don't think we are exposed to that outside of that um, because they're so so afraid to speak up yeah know? it's a great point and it's I think it's an instructive one for the secular community of not um, not staying inside of our own bubble, and I think that's. But I think that's happening in all communities now, and it's very hard to break out of your comfort zone and break out of your bubble. And and of course, what happens when you sit down with somebody who seems so different from you, and then you have a real human to human interaction, is that lo and behold, they're just like you. You've got common interests. You want the same things for your children. I mean, it's the same all over the world for the most part, and then maybe there's 5% of the people that ruin it for all the rest of us, of course, but you know, for the most part, people want the same things, and the way that you resolve conflict is by sitting down and breaking bread and, and, and so on. And so I think it's a great point. Our uh, rabbi, who, who just got to the Washington DC humanist, Jewish humanistic community, he's just started like this week or whatever, has been, um, there's this, there's this million ministers march happening on Monday. And it, first of all, it won't be a million ministers. But, and secondly, <laughs> it's organized by Reverend Al Sharpton. And uh, David Silverman at American Atheist had been in conversation with them about will non-theistic uh, clergy be included in this million minister march? And they said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then David Silverman, pointed out, well, your materials say this, this, and this, it was all faith-based, and would you include, uh, would you add to that people? And so some of the language was changed a little bit, but now we still haven't heard whether there will be any speakers represented from, and I presume David, so knowing a little bit about David Silverman, I presume he thought he would be the speaker. <laughs> but um, it hasn't yet been announced whether there would actually be any speakers from the non-theistic community. And, and, and that's the, the kind of challenge we have, this tension of, first of all, you know, shouldn't people be allowed to express their opinions from their perspective? Sure. So if this is just about religious people making a statement, then okay. But if you really want to expand that tent, they, sh they should have included non-theistic folks as well and, and, and be in conversation with us. And, and so that's a piece that we, we can push for. Yes? Uh, you've covered a lot of important and meaningful topics. I want to react to a couple mm -hmm. of them. Uh, the first is community. And um, I see... Uh, well, let me step aside and say, I, I want to, uh, in my mind, I'm pulling together uh, the secular uh, humanist Judaism with the hub, okay? To me, community should come first, okay? And we're talking about in-group community. We are a community of us. So, uh, as we often say here, we invite people uh, to join us, and and we emphasize all are welcome and a variety. You can be religious; nothing bad will happen, you know, and all that. And so people often say, "I'm looking for a place where there are like-minded people." Mm -hmm. So that sense of community, which ritual I think reinforces, uh, is important. Uh, and, and you addressed it first. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see community in in two parts. I don't know about parts, but in two ways. The in-group community to strengthen the bonds uh, 
your presentation, the coffee and community and so forth. But there's a larger community, and particularly as a humanist, I think, I feel a sense of obligation. I think this is true, you know, about humanism, that, that we feel an obligation, not only humanists, but to go to the larger community, let's say Denver and vicinity, or all Colorado if you're ambitious, uh, and to, to do two things, is to equate them with what we're all about, who we are, what we're for, what we're not for, okay? And also, uh, the second aspect, which you mentioned, uh, and that is the, the helping of others. Uh, you know, religions have done that uh, for a long period of time, administering to, okay. The hub has uh, an acronym that spells CARE. The four pillars of the hub, you, you may be familiar with it, I don't know. How many of you are? Community, altruism, reason, and education. Okay? So we look at the first two. Community is number one. Okay? And again, community here, you come here, you're safe, you're accepted, uh, you can feel comfortable, you're free. Uh, and then when you combine that with altruism, then you get our a volunteer core. Uh, you get our uh, uh, standing outside Planned Parenthood facility and holding up signs in support of those who go on Saturday uh, for abortion, okay? And there are always protesters, okay? So we've done that. And, and I, think, I think there's that, that dual emphasis that fits together, okay? I see humanism as, as a a very broad umbrella. I'm an atheist, but to me it's part of my humanism mm -hmm. and humanitarianism, mm -hmm. which for some reason it seems to me that word has lost favor. Mm -hmm. it, I don't hear that word much anymore. Right. I don't know why, but in any event, uh, humanitarianism. Yeah, I uh, think it's a great point, and I think that often people associate humanitarianism perhaps with you know, going to uh, the third world to help people get clean water, as opposed to what needs to be happening every single day. Right. In, Sending in, money yeah. uh, overseas. Yeah, to some, uh, I think you're making excellent points, and and thank you for that. Uh, there's a there's a tension between insider and outsider in almost everything that we do, and some of it is just inevitable. I mean, in our careers, when you work to a certain level of competency. That can't happen to somebody who just walked through the door. Um, and, and that takes education versus in a community when someone just walk, walks through a door. As welcoming as, as you might be, very few people, even if they have a great time, are going to walk back out and say, I'm not part of that community. I'm an insider. Because it doesn't work that way. And, and we talked a little bit about this with uh, some of the internal conversations at, at Beth Ami is, to me, community is what happens when you're off doing other things. You know, when you are trying to fix the world with the same group of people, before you know it, you turn around and you say, okay, we're a community. Versus what I think has been set up too often and then fails, which is to say, we are establishing a community, come on in. I think that if we flipped it and we focused on exactly what you're saying, what what are the needs in, in this community? How can we fix those problems? And who will join us in doing it? And then when you turn around and have those intimate one-on-one -on -one conversations, lo and behold, they are like-minded, like us, and, and then they're part of our community. I really appreciate all of you coming out today. Thank you so much. Much from all of you. I really didn't know much about Beth and me, so I've learned a lot today.
And we have we have our own ritual here. <laughs> Whenever we have a speaker at the hub, we ask him or her to sign our oh, banner. <laughs> our wall of fame here.